Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I ask big questions of brilliant people. Today's question is, what does every teacher need to know about neuroplasticity and learning? And I'm in conversation with Jennifer A. Hawkins. Okay, so I'm Dr. Jennifer A. Hawkins, and I'm a former primary and secondary teacher in a former life a long time ago. And... uh, I taught mainstream art and English and special needs pupils, young offenders in a remand centre. And then in 2000, I decided I wanted to do research for my master's by research. And I then uh, gave up full time teaching and started to do freelance work to collect my data for my what eventually turned into my PhD. So, and I'm still doing it. I'm now getting on a bit and I'm enjoying it so much that I'm researching now on Twitter and LinkedIn and getting lots of fascinating information. What are you researching at the moment? I've been, I've been re- researching neuroplasticity and learning and I'm hoping to open up pathways for teachers and practitioners in areas that I think will they'll find helpful so I I just find neuroplasticity fascinating so I've uh, my first book um, was a theory of learning which I wrote about from my PhD research and I've taken that further forward to get involved in researching neuroplasticity So just for the uninitiated, what does neuroplasticity mean? Right. Um, Gosh, (laughs) (laughs) I've got reams and reams of explanations on that. But I'm just trying to think. You see, this sort of thing helps a lot because you think, right, you need a succinct message here. And um, whereas I get bogged down in all these thoughts. So um, basically how your brain works by looking at the scientific research and um, we, we have uh, electrical imaging and all that sort of stuff going on and um, explaining how your body brain works um, but it's all terribly complicated and I don't know whether I can explain it in one sentence <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody else has um, so yeah but now I, now you've set me a job so I shall have to do that <laughs> how would I explain neuroplasticity to a five-year-old that's always the the <laughs> challenge I set myself is is if I can't explain it to a five-year-old then I I, I need to to think think again it's, uh... right. well it's all to do with electrochemicals apparently and uh, all these complicated stuff okay so um yeah and, and what's the link between neuroplasticity and learning Right, well, it's basically what it's all about. It's the fundamental thing that drives learning, isn't it? And um, so I've tried to connect two or three things up, psychology research but I, um, and neuroscience research. So I've done a huge amount of reading up on all that stuff. But I've, I always try, because I'm a phenomenological researcher, which means that the stuff that affects me in my daily life, I try to connect with what I'm researching, my reading and everything. So it's been brilliant on Twitter and LinkedIn because I've met all sorts of other teachers and found out all the different things they're working on. For instance, I listened to your podcast with Lucy Six, um, who I have a lot in common with because I um i'm a creative person and a painter and i did now i was going to say i did paintings in my phd uh about my feelings and emotions so i'm very much into that uh area creativity but now i'm looking across all the subjects and uh exploring other people's um discoveries in that field so Quite often, for instance, listening to Lucy talking on your other podcast, she's a creative person who helps young people in camps, apparently. I've done quite a lot of evaluating with that sort of thing. I did it through the Arts Council in Manchester and went into schools and watched teachers working with creative practitioners. 
uh, to do their research. So, oh, that must have been fascinating. So um, I'm sort of continued that in that vein. My book that has already been published two years ago um, explains how I did all that research around collecting stuff and uh, data and. I'm now carrying on and looking at the concer current concerns of teachers, psychologists and therapists on the internet. So I'm very intrigued about this interplay between your um, art and then the kind of neuroscience because at a glance to an outsider those things feel <laughs> poles apart, right? One is yeah. the kind of, you know, very, very sciencey and yeah. sort of specific and the other is well quite the opposite or yeah. maybe not clearly you've married the two so tell, tell me more about that well I look at um, teachers work um, but I also find that the neuroscience I can understand best in a narrative form so one of the things I'm doing in my new book is I'm looking at the history of how neuroscience was discovered neuroplasticity was discovered and I'm telling some of the stories I've discovered by other writers which are kind of ring a bell to me as a teacher oh. and help me to understand it so I'm kind of I take it I regard myself as an ordinary teacher researcher and I've just developed my interest over the years um, kind of trying to work out what makes us tick really human beings and I'm finding that fascinating so it, it sounds to me like you're trying to keep away from that danger zone of becoming overly kind of academic in the way that we communicate, which I think can sometimes alienate the people whose practice yes. we really want to, to actually impact on, can't it? And, and have you found that you've had success with that? Have people been able to pick up your ideas and use them? I think that's still much, very much a coming thing. I get the odd person who's, who straight away connects with my book. Yeah. But when it was sold originally, um, the chapters were sold separately because they're sort of on different subjects. Okay. And um, that seems because I've divided it up into areas to try and make it a bit more accessible because it's such a difficult subject. It's a huge, massive subject. So in my next book, I'm hoping to um, kind of point the way for people in different areas across education and give them some pointers as to references um, which would help them pursue their own particular interest. And what are the things that you hope people would do differently if they engage with your, your kind of learning and teaching? I found, I found that exploring how your brain works is, gives you a huge insight. If you can connect it up with your practice, it sort of informs your practice. So I'm kind of hoping that what I write supports what people already do and kind of justifies good practice because I find a lot of really good teachers out there who are working with the plastic brain of their learners. I would say that Lucy Six is one of them from what you say, but I think that if you, if you can, justify what you're doing to those who are in charge who are managing you this would be very beneficial <laughs> and uh, would perhaps help them to understand why you're doing what you're doing and that you're actually are doing something sensible that makes sense in human terms for your learners and can you give an example of the, the sort of practice you might be talking about so you've kind of talked about lucy but what might this look like in, in a classroom when you say that, you know, there might be a teacher who might be quite intuitively working with their learners, plastic brains. What does that mean in practice? Well, you would be realizing that the children are very much uh, have their length of concentration span. You would develop your empathy so that you can um, spot when children need particular interventions. And many teachers have already developed those. So we're talking, I think, on Twitter about Lynn McCann, who does wonderful work teaching teachers about autism. Yeah. Um, and that we need to be aware that we need to develop this, our knowledge of different sorts of students, um, be aware of them, but also relate that to our own practice. Um, 
that actually we are following the science that we are there is a scientific reason why we are intuiting good practice and are there any things that people kind of habitually do or regularly do or perhaps that older schools of thinking might have thought were good practice that your research would suggest isn't helping our learners is there things we should avoid i think that the um uh over emphasis upon testing would be an obvious one which most teachers would agree with in the current climate i think that that's uh, that um that uh there are sort of repressive ways of teaching which are not sufficiently empathic and um, in actual fact i believe that's quite an ignorant way to go on because you need to take account of we need to develop our professionalism in responding to individual learners one of my my current memes is um, we're all part of the human family but neuroplasticity makes us all unique. Oh, that's nice. And is, is neuroplasticity something that kind of, I think my, my understanding in my kind of younger years had always been that, you know, that it's really only something that we have when we're younger, but that my more recent understanding is that actually our brains are kind of plastic throughout our lifetimes and that there's always the capacity for change. Yes. If you look, if I look at myself, I always try and relate things to my own experience or other people's experience. I like to ask them how they feel. So that's interesting you saying that, because I think that um, I was a very different person when I was teaching, and I've changed enormously as I've gone on. And I can see how I've become kind of an expert in my narrow field, really. Although I'm trying to expand it across. Um, we all only have um, our own corridors, but we need to listen to other people because we need all of us to bring our experience. Um, but I think you can develop your brain over the years, and I think I have in the area I'm interested in, and that's what all learners do. You know, yeah. I think I'm different now than I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago at the end of my... Well, at the end of my life but it, you know <laughs> where I am now I can look back and say ah oh, you know I've carried on learning and I, th I think that's a really powerful thing actually isn't it it's certainly something that I I've come to kind of later but have come to really enjoy picking up new skills and hobbies and realizing that learning is really fun at, at whatever age and yes. certainly as a, as a parent it's something I found has been really important is to, to just have a go and learn alongside my children and let go of the perfectionism and, and just have fun with it really. Yes yeah I think so and I think teachers learn from their pupils which lots of them will say they do as well. Yeah. Um, I remember doing outdoor pursuits in Wales with uh, teenage special needs kids and I'd never done anything very physical I had elderly very religious parents as a child and d didn't do anything very physical at all so when I did that in my 30s I think I learned more from abseiling and climbing in the climbing room and doing I had to do canoeing and the kids all volunteered they the were with instructors they'd say who goes first and they'd all look at me and go missus and I'd just have to go you know and I developed <laughs> my confidence I remember doing an 80 foot uh, wire glide you know and that oh. sort of thing and um, the instructor shouting do you want to, who's next and they went watch out it's a big one coming down <laughs> you throw yourself you know um into everything so and i felt it gave me confidence huge amount of confidence i hadn't had i was a very buttoned up teacher before that oh really so okay. it's not always about learning over the longer term there could be an experience that's kind of really formative and really begins to to kind of shift things well, that sort of connects up with what um, Lucy was saying about um, bringing children together in new experiences and designing the environment for them and giving them a social environment with new people to meet mm. and bonding as a family and working in a summer camp or whatever it was she was saying, yeah. um, doing art activities, you know.
But um, the interesting work I did in Salford in Manchester was um, a researching program for teachers. And I was a mentor on that and then became the evaluator for part of it. And um, the teachers chose a creative practitioner to do that sort of work, to pursue their own research question with their classes right across junior and secondary. Mm -hmm. And they devised their own research question and they chose their artist, their art form, in order to do it. So it could be a 10 year old boy is doing creative, wanting to help their creative writing. And they might get a book illustrator and a storyteller in. And then they would, um, we would try, they would decide where the research was going with the artist helping them. So somebody like Lucy, who's very um, adept at helping those sort of social, emotional um, learning situations to happen to set it up and in a way it isn't as predictable as your normal classroom it depends on the, the what the teacher is doing but sometimes I think we just make it so boring for children how do you mean well you know you everything you, you will read this you'll read this you'll do that you'll learn that and that you know, and you're on a sort of railway track. And you don't think that's and, optimal for learning? And you might do an exam at the end of it. But I think that's part of it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But I think we ought to mix it up a bit. And how do you think we should be mixing it up? Um, I think I'm very keen believer in teacher research. Obviously, I've done lots myself. But um, also working with these teachers and watching what they learned from working with creative people. That was very interesting. Um, and I can't see any reason why you can't have creative science, creative maths. And the more I read about it, the more that seems possible, you know? Um, obviously you have to learn knowledge and, and have your, learn your subject language and your subject uh, important frameworks. Yeah. But I think that teachers working individually with their own class can, could, could research collaboratively. Yeah. It would be a much better way to go. It's, it's one of the interesting things I found during the, um, the course of the pandemic where some schools and, and organisations have given teachers a bit more freedom with the curriculum where perhaps learners aren't having to, to do exams and, and so on. And some of the directions that teachers have chosen to take things have been really fascinating, really inspiring. And um, my daughter, uh, one of my daughters has a, a fabulous science tutor who um, has made science really exciting for her. My daughter thought she might be interested in science before and now she's really up for it. Yesterday she had a online tutorial with, uh, with Sally um, and she said, I need marshmallows and a microwave. And I was like, okay, why? And she said, because we're going to work out the speed of light. Oh, wonderful. And, and I, I don't know how that went or why, why marshmallows in a microwave would help, but my, my daughter, I'm sure, could tell you. And she certainly came out very enthused. And, you know, it's, yes. yeah, I think, I don't know. I, I, and I don't think, you know, everything doesn't always, as you say, have to be whiz-bang and fantastic, does it? But it's about oh. firing and engaging, isn't it? That's right. So as I'm reading through the neuroscience stories about different people, for instance, who we had disability or whatever, uh, how they solved their problem. Quite a lot of neuroscientists actually did have disability. It's interesting to find out. There's quite oh. a lot of interesting stories. So um, I'm referencing it as I go along to these different books in different areas. And it's kind of, uh, as I do my research, it's ended up being across teachers' current concerns, because being phenomenological, which means whatever happens, basically, <laughs> your take on whatever happens. So there's, um, so I've ended up with four chapters on education, sort of inclusion, mental health, and all this stuff, all informed by practitioners and people, including some of them who've had experiences themselves, who very generously agreed to let me use their um, stories, poems, or videos, um, which supports what I'm, which sort of uh, supports the theory. I'm sort of developing a backup theory. Oh, 
Tell me uh, more, or is it too early? Um, well, my first book just said that, as far as I could make out as a teacher, everybody's emotions and feelings were actually rational. They made sense to them, yeah. whether or not they made sense to anybody else. And that's just that simple concept was the foundation of my PhD. And then I then, but um, it was met with a fair amount of derision to start with. Oh, uh, <laughs> just uh, this, anybody I tried to explain it to, you know, sort of, oh, from that's obvious, isn't it? You know, that people's feelings would make sense to them, to mm -hmm. um, so how are you going to prove that then? Because it's all so vague. But then I found that there were methods for um, proving that. And in my research, I developed a way of, um, of recording what people's feelings and emotions were. And provided it was person, place, and time specific, uh, it stands as a piece of data. So it may change, you may change your view of it, but whatever was recorded then, and I thought that was terribly useful for teachers. Because if you do a video of your classroom with a lesson that went really well, you could stand back. When I was doing evaluation of teachers and artists doing their research, um, I could easily stand back. I had to think about it a lot in retrospect, but I could see that they were doing pre-language skills and all this sort of thing. And you find stuff out. It's fascinating. Wow. So did, did people become more convinced as you worked through this, yes. this process? Yes. Yeah. So um, I work, I did, uh, I've done a chat, I did a, a three threads of work, teachers, reasons. And all I said to them was, what can you tell me about your feelings and emotions about teaching and learning? And I didn't specify, I didn't give questionnaires, I didn't specify, and they all came out with pertinent stuff. Interesting. Some of them drew pictures while they were doing it as well. I did a kind of, um, so while we were chatting, um, their unconscious drew a picture. I would give them crayons and things. I've got those in my first book, some of them, um, which I put in anonymously. Some of them wrote their life story and I just picked extracts about why they became a teacher. Many of them had problems themselves at school and wanted to help children. A bit like the neuroscientists that had disabilities mm. um, themselves. Um, yeah. mm. So I had great fun with it, really. I got in touch with Barbara Arrowsmith Young, who wrote a book, I think it was 2006, The Woman Who Rebuilt Her Mind. She was born with a um, full set of learning difficulties in every direction <laughs> sort of mm. thing um, and she um, now runs a school in Canada and she's worked out how children can be helped um, in different ways she I think she's the last time I looked she had 19 interventions and it's a lot of that's to do with repetition mm -hmm. so um, a bit like some dyslexia programs um, do five or ten minutes a day of doing reading uh, nonsensible phonics um, for ten minutes every day for three years, and gradually the dyslexic brain um, adjusts to improving its skills. Mm -hmm. So yeah, wow. so I've discovered a huge amount. It, but the trouble is, it's such a massive amount of I've got. One and a half thousand references of uh, books, books and papers. Oh, wow. Um, so how did you decide for the second book then? Like what, to, you know, what, what, where are you focusing on? What's the thing that you most need to share um, that you've learned? Right. Well, I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a list of some of the things. Um, neural maps change their borders. They become greater and less detailed. They move around the brain and can even disappear, which I thought was fascinating. What does that mean? Well, these are the electrical connections that are made. You know how with uh, neural imaging, you can watch people recognizing photographs 
and you can see their feelings and emotions happening in their brain and their, it's also your body as well so mm -hmm. um but we're so hugely complicated and i found it very difficult to get my head around it all but i just think right what how do i regard this as a teacher and what can i get out of it yeah so it's helped me to understand how complicated um, our brains are. Plus, another fascinating fact is that the, your electrical connections can be anything between two to two hundred miles an hour. Oh, and what, why the why the difference? Well, it, because it varies depending on. Um, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> we just have no idea. But, um, I, think, I think we can all empathise with that a bit, can't we? We yes. all have those days when it feels like two miles an hour. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I would say that definitely relates to me. But, um, you know, but also you have that flash moment. Um, but whether or not that's actually making sense of anything, I don't know. It may be just a response to stimulus. Hmm. You know, where you suddenly somebody comes up and gives you a fright or something, you know. Ugh, you know. Mm, mm, mm. Um, so it's all fascinating stuff um and yeah so i've been extracting stuff like that and there's a lady um who came out with a with a book on the emotions and she says that every emotion is different so every emotion you feel is slightly different because your neural paths are slightly different every time you feel something you have certain patterns, but you also have sort of blips and you have random stuff going on. Okay, so even if I if it feels similar, like I might feel sad about something one day and then sad about something another day, but it will be a slightly different... Apparently, yes. So, um, but I, fa I, found, I found I can extract from that, like you've just done with me, something that makes sense from that mm. to you. If yeah. you see what I mean, because when you read this big complicated book, it's yeah. quite hard to extract that. But I think it's useful. I think that the lay person needs to. It would inform our lives enormously if we knew all this stuff, some of this stuff, you know, the, the main points. Yeah. So feelings are like fingerprints then, I'm thinking. That's where my head's gone with that. <laughs> <laughs> and do you find that with... You see, learning all the time and it, it seems you know you've done a huge amount of research that's taken you in lots of different directions and and yes do you find now that you find yourself reflecting on you know other times in your career and thinking i wish i would have known this yes. then yes I, that's what started me off i was teaching special needs teenagers and um i just felt there was more to it you know that we were sort of retraining them on reading schemes it was back in the dark ages really i mean much better nowadays um and uh i thought you know these children have got emotional problems so i worked with teenagers who refused to go to school that was one of my strands as well and i spent a lot of time over two years going into their houses as a home tutor and getting to know their situation yeah. and uh, I learned things that I couldn't possibly have known as a teacher in the classroom and like I found that, that um, well some of them had there were there was bereavement there was um, parents with mental health problems which is a very tricky one mm. um, you know obviously um, and quite a lot of the children would become a carer for the parent and that sort of thing but very subtle stuff was going on. Some of them were bullied um, and some quite serious stuff going on. But um, and what I, what I found worked really well was getting them to choose, make a choice. So I would do an educational program with them and I'd say, this is the syllabus. Um, what do you want? And then uh, have a think about this is what the next bit of the syllabus is because I was doing GCSE. Mm. And when I and when I come next week, I'll ask you where you want to start, because there you, then you're starting somewhere that they've chosen that they feel they have some kind of a hook into, because they recognise something yeah. that connects with what's in their head. 
rather than you telling them they've got to follow this external track. Maybe a bit of a feeling of control for them as well, I, I, I guess. Control, but also they would hook onto something they recognised. I see. So that, yes. Okay. So you're so, building on what's already there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And did you find that in those conversations that you had with young people who were uh, struggling with school, that it always kind of made sense once you stopped and listened to them? Or were there some that stayed... Not necessarily. I found that, they, that very often people can't explain what their problem is. And it's not always terribly helpful to expect them to. I think that sometimes, a bit like psychoanalysis, you may be reinforcing the problems. And when you read up about neuroplasticity, it's about embedding neural nets. So if you keep asking them about their problems, you're actually maybe reinforcing them. Uh -huh. So it would be better to, um, and I found chatting to Dr. Jeffrey James, who does a behavior, he does behavior program, which is very good, which is solution focused. If you focus on the solution, which is what he does with children, he doesn't give them the solution. He asks them to find it themselves and then encourages them. He has his own brilliant method. Um, but basically it's building on positive neural nets, which, um, you know, it's like a bit like um, the other lady was saying, sorry, I've forgotten her name. Lucy. Lucy was saying, <laughs> my brain gets all over the place with all this stuff. Um, <laughs> She was saying she's giving them confidence. Well, I could explain to her why that's working. Yeah. If we were and having a yeah, chat, yeah. because she's actually, she's giving them the social and peer group stuff that teenagers need for their brains. And she's stimulating them and it's positive. That makes sense. She was, so she was saying they're choosing, you know, they're given an opportunity, but they're supported to do what they want basically in that situation so it's a bit like choosing from a syllabus this is what's available what would you like to do yeah and what about things that we'll often see in adolescence that we know is a massive time of, of kind of you know big brain development and we often see things around kind of pushing of boundaries and like risk-taking behavior are those sorts of things things that have kind of come up in your work at all or yes I've been recently I've been doing um I've, I'm just doing a section about the teenage brain and um this book's brilliant Sarah Jane Blakemore if you oh, she's fabulous that. yeah inventing ourselves secret life of the teenage brain so I'm working from that at the moment, but I haven't done much of it, so I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know the answer. Where I'm yet. up to. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair enough. And I, I wondered as well, um, when we were talking about how, you know, thinking what you know now and, and how that might have informed decisions and, and your practice earlier in your career. I'm particularly interested in you said you spent some time working with young offenders. Yes. Um, and yeah, tell me more about, about that and what you think you know now that might have informed that practice or would help other people working with similar youngsters. Um, that you need to listen to them and to believe what they say. Tell me more. Because I think that if you come from a different background, you find it really hard to imagine the sorts of things that have happened to other people. So it's almost like you have this as kind of a natural law of first comparisons for us that we um, only understand what we already understand, if you see what I mean. So it's hard. We need to um, actually take on board what people are saying to us instead of interpreting it through our own experience or negating it you know that surely that can't be possible or trying to solve their problems for them doesn't work that's quite hard though isn't it it's hard so yeah. how do we do that how do we succeed in that well you I, you do um counseling skills person-centered counseling helps with that um, so I think probably probably a bit of that might be on teacher training courses. I've not come across it, but I think maybe it should be. At least I think teachers should consider their own childhood. 
to mm. some extent. Um, because do you think that their experience will so heavily influence their how they interpret what they see? Not necessarily, but I think that um, I, I don't think that necessarily is so, but I think it's likely. So yeah. at least I think you should think about it. Yeah. It's, it's difficult because some people haven't had particularly traumatic experiences, you know, and you've got to accept that as well. If you, if I mean, I had quite a difficult childhood, but I have to accept that some people don't. Some people have a marvelous childhood. Yeah. It is it's one of the things that I um I find interesting as an adult because I live now in very different circumstances than those which I grew up and I've worked really hard to ensure that uh, my children have a uh, you know it, it's a, it's a different experience than I had yes. as a child and I find myself every now and then just wishing that I could transplant them for just an hour or two just just because I think sometimes but it's exactly as you say, I think they, they just only know their own experience and I think yes. it can sometimes be helpful to look outside of that. I think um, we're all like that and that's that's something we need to teach children to talk to each other and, and understand walking in other people's shoes yeah. much more, much earlier. Yeah. So that they you know, so then you would have uh, the multicult the cross cultural thing, the decolonizing the curriculum thing would happen if we all respected each other's stories and believed each other more yeah maybe if we were even assuming, a little bit more curious yeah assuming everybody's like me yeah. um i don't i dislike the class the idea of class structure as well because i was quite a privileged child financially but i was also underprivileged as far as i had a mother with mental health difficulties mm. so i it annoys me when and I also, when I was talking to teachers and they told me why they went into teaching, some of them had really poor upbringings and were discriminated against at school. Um, I'm thinking of one person in particular who became head boy and was discriminated against because he was from a poor home but had wonderful parents who believed in education, took him to the library and... Um, were marvellous parents, you know, they were been underprivileged themselves, but they gave him a wonderful um, educational upbringing. Yeah. Even though they didn't have a car and they couldn't afford, he said there was always money for books, even though we couldn't, they couldn't afford shoes. You wow. know, so you can't assume anything. Yeah. No, absolutely. And certainly in, in, in my work, one of the things that I see often is this kind of middle class neglect which you know where where families are working so hard um, yep. and their children might have everything that one could wish for in terms of material possessions but what they're really lacking is the time and space to feel really heard by a significant adult in their lives and it's it's you know it brings me great sadness when i hear those kinds of stories from youngsters because i know when i i hear them speak that I can identify with those parents and I'm sure they're doing the, they think they're doing yes. the best yes. thing. All, all of the children who didn't go to school that I went and tutored, there were 12 all together. All of the parents really loved their children. They were just not in, a, in the right place to help them as much as they wanted to. Um, mm. I mean, I think that there are really bad parents, but they're very few and far between. Most parents, you know, really would like to help their children. They're just not in a position to do so for one reason or another. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes it, it can get quite toxic, can't it? That I think parents and carers can feel quite blamed if things aren't going uh, quite as, as we'd hope for their child, that it can sometimes feel that they, they feel that this is their fault or that people feel it's their fault. And that can make that relationship. Between well, I, I, had, um, I had one, per, one parent who was being about to be prosecuted. I was taken away from the situation because the younger child went to school and the older one wouldn't go. And the single parent who was bereaved, had only been bereaved a year before, um, couldn't cope with the two teenagers. And because the younger one went to school quite happily, the older one, he was going to be prosecuted for not sending his child to school. But he didn't know what to do. He was out at work all day and she just mm. kept coming home. <laughs> you know and he couldn't 
So I think situations or uh, stuff happens, doesn't it? Absolutely. You were not expecting to happen. And that child wrote me a long essay about a parent who didn't know whether to tell their child that he was terminally ill. She was terminally ill. Wow. And the, you know, so the mother had died. And, um, but they hadn't told the child. The child was angry, I think, because this had suddenly disrupted their life and they didn't know why and they had no sympathy at school and were just told they had to keep going to school. You know, nobody gave any counselling or... Um, I think the whole family probably needed counselling from the shock, you know. Yeah, that's really difficult, isn't it? And I think that's the thing. Sometimes when we stop and we listen to the stories that, that people tell us about their lives and the things that they're experiencing that we can begin to yeah em empathize a little bit more and perhaps help them in, in in better ways but that can be hard though can't it i mean in a school setting in particular things are so busy and as a teacher you've got 30 children in your class yeah. and can you be expected to to understand and empathize with each one of them no but i think you can give the right sort of response in the moment actually okay and what what does that look like how do you mean by um, the right it looks like listening taking and um giving them a little bit of space tiny bit of space perhaps not much but just a few seconds where you just take a moment or you ask to speak to them on their own at some point that's appropriate if you have a teaching assistant you you know you you talk to them on their own when you get an opportunity um I think I think teachers will have to find their own solutions. I don't think there's a magic method, really. Uh, we all, but just if we were more aware, we might be able to develop techniques. I think I'm a great believer in. I think lots of teachers do have their techniques, and that if you're aware, you can develop and support each other and collaborate together to develop good practice. Yeah, it it, it sounds like some of the work that you're doing is about taking what is intuitive to some of our more inspired educators and providing yes. the research about why it works and why they should trust their instincts. That's yes, I think, I think so, because I think it's providing you with the justification for what you're doing. I mean, I used to do my outdoor pursuits, develop programs for my special needs students. I ran the school garden and we used to have planting out seeds certificates and, you know, different stuff um, that we I developed. But I couldn't justify it. So when the national curriculum came in, people were actually saying, these children are entitled to a normal classroom. And I'm saying, but they can't read or write. They're meant to sit at the back. This is secondary school. And some of them are included because they're well behaved and quiet. They can sit at the back. But they can't, won't be able to take an exam at the end of it, probably. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not really being supported properly. So that's seen because of the attitude of ordinary main school, that that was seen as a solution. But of course it isn't, as you know. Um, so they're kind of overlooked and made to be normal, which doesn't do them any good at all because they do need special help. Yeah, so inclusion is not always the answer. So, um, yeah, so all of my certificates and things were thrown out of the window and uh, the whole of the organization was closed down. We were attached to a comprehensive school eventually after I left. Um, so really the systems have got to be made suitable as well and what we need is management that understands so i think that has to come from the bottom up and you're right you have master crafter teachers i call them <laughs> I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of them on twitter and they really know their stuff but they need to be allowed to um teachers need a sort of career path where they can they learn on the ground and I think the Finnish method is brilliant where they're all researching as they teach. You, you, you can do it retrospectively, you can look, think of your data afterwards and you can do it on a daily basis for each, you plan your lesson 
you can do it in a very um, easy manner. It doesn't have to be a great long essay or anything. So what might that look like for your typical teacher who might be listening to this? Because lots of teachers that I speak to are scared about research. It feels like this yes. other thing. Yeah, I understand that. Um, but you, um, if you can learn to just do what's possible, and even if you only do a little tiny bit of something, for instance, I'm a governor at a junior school and this teacher was saying to me, I had an idea, I set up a video camera and I thought I'd film myself and see how I interacted. So I did that and I was amazed she only did one film. She didn't do a program of research on any particular thing. And she said, it's changed my whole practice. I suddenly saw the children I was ignoring. Wow. You know, as I walked around the class, I didn't realize. I just set the camera up. And when I looked back and reflected on it, so what you can often do now with modern technology, you can do that. And you don't have to keep masses of children's paperwork. You know, we used to have great cupboards full of artwork and stuff. You can just photograph it. And then when you review your every six months review back what you've been doing on whatever it is you're particularly trying to develop or you know you want to see how you went just be honest and share it with other teachers uh, what you've found if you discover something amazing you're proud of share it with your colleagues you know and that's mm -hmm. research basically I, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you. It's, it's one of the things I, I have the great privilege of working with loads of really inspiring practitioners all the time. And, and so often it will take quite a lot of coaxing from me to encourage them to share the great stuff that they're doing, because this might be, you know, learning support assistant who doesn't have loads of letters after their name or something, but I've watched them right. and what they're doing yeah. is great. Yes. And you just want more people to be able to, to learn from that. Yes. Um, We've got two teaching assistants at the junior school. I go in and I, I just get them to talk to me and they're doing, they've been doing the ELSA course yeah. and they've got their little room where they take children to who are having difficulties, you know, emotional difficulties. And they have hanging up from the ceiling on string uh, stars where the children have written things like, um, I wish I could get on better with so-and-so, you know, whoever it is, their friend. Um, it's upset me because I'm not talking to so-and-so and or whatever. My mummy's not well or something like that. Um, I miss my granddad. would be a lot of that, I'm afraid, at the moment. Or nanny or something. And I said to them, at the end of the term, could you put them all on a piece of paper and just photograph them? They haven't got the children's names on or anything. But you will be able to get themes out of that. Yeah. Just look at them and analyse them and go, ah. Oh, We've had so many bereavements, children worrying about friendships, one or two that think that feel they're being bullied um, or whatever, you know, somebody that's not very good at something that they're worrying about. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, <laughs> but that's a simple piece of research, actually. Okay. Yeah. And you can collect that and keep those sheets and you just put the date on and say that's what we did that term oh what did you think about the next term did we, you do you think we did better that way we found some uh resources that helped to address those problems um you know yeah so it's really about kind of making sure that we stop and we're curious about our practice and we learn from what's working and and yeah explore a little really isn't it I think people have the idea you've got to plan ahead and rigidly stick to a, a program of research, but actually the sort of research I do is much better in retrospect when you look back and you admit your way, you, you admit your failure at the beginning if you're not doing something well, and then you look back and say, oh, we made progress on that particular <laughs> thing. If you don't admit failure, you can't admit progress properly you can prove progress if you keep a record of failure <laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan of sharing mistakes I often um, will set people a task when I'm working with them to uh, be brave and bold enough to share a mistake with a colleague because I think when we do that then it stops someone else having to walk that same path in the same way doesn't it because we learn so much from the things that we do less well yes absolutely yeah I, I agree with that okay. 
what thought would you like to to kind of uh, summarize with or, or leave leave people with what would you like them to think about having listened to this right well i think that they ought to come up with a much better definition of neuroplasticity than me because there's <laughs> lots of very clever people out there <laughs> And what would you like to, you know, if, if people kind of went away and, and changed one thing about their, their practice or how they approach things in, in the classroom or at school, what would you? Note what's not working and um, have a look to see how you've improved or not, presumably, but um, mostly. The trouble with teachers is they're so well-meaning and lovely people that they don't record their successes. So record your successes by looking to what you've what you've helped, because they often don't tell you about what was wrong to start with, and they never they're never always satisfied with what they've achieved. But usually they've achieved all sorts of things, you know. And they are researching and they are working really well. A lot of them, in my experience, anyway. Obviously, we do make mistakes, but I think uh, the sort of prove, justify what you're doing. Most people know really why they're doing what they're doing. They just don't take time to explain it to themselves or to other people. Mm -hmm.